So a little history. In 1775. Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at a very heavily requested Sam O'Neill Academy video called Timothy Dexter, The Dumbest Rags to Riches Story. <laughs> I'm not sure why this one is so heavily recommended, but let's find out. Hey kids, now we all know that fate is a fickle thing. Some of us may try to defy its will, but there's enough small businesses with Pizza Hut roofs out there to tell you- Is that one a church? Wow. <laughs> That's- that's crazy. That such a thing is ultimately futile. As for most of us, we tend to have our fair share of good and bad luck throughout our lives. But every now and then, RN Jesus smiles upon some Whoa. drooling little loaf child and says, You, my son, you shall be the one with all the figgy pudding. <laughs> that child was okay. Timothy Dexter. Dexter was born in Malden, Massachusetts in 1747. He had a mm. humble upbringing, dropping out of school as an eight-year-old to work as a farmhand and a leather worker. But Dexter thought he deserved better, so when he grew up, he married one one Elizabeth Frothing Ham, a rich widow in need of company. Gold digging achieved, he began his quest to become a true aristocrat. As his first step, he thinks, hmm, all the rich guys I know are in positions of power. I should run for office. Now, the town of Makes Malden sense. wasn't much keen on appointing a bumbling second grade dropout, but after rejecting dozens of petitions sent in by Dexter, they eventually gave up and decided to just make some shit up, leading to Dexter becoming the official informer of deer, tasking him with keeping <laughs> logs on the local deer. deer population. And over statistics of does and bucks alike, Dexter ruled with an iron fist, triumphantly concluding what many had already known. What's interesting is nuclear power plants, um, because they're so safe and secluded, a lot of times are on wildlife refuge. And what's interesting is there are cases where there's wildlife refuge, it can be right next to somebody's deer lease, and then they go out hunting, shoot the deer, and the deer is like right on the border between the deer lease and the property of the plant, which is a nature preserve. And if it falls there, or I guess it's more common with birds as well, but if it falls on the property of the plant, the nuclear plant actually has to pay the fine. Crazy. But there weren't any deer in Malden, Massachusetts. Satisfied with his political career, Dexter then set his sights on greater financial ventures. So a little history, in 1775, <laughs> Oh, that, <laughs> that British Isle and the little 13 colonies stick to together like some type of Frankenstein monster is so funny. <laughs> That's awesome. Part of our growing independence from Britain, the Continental Congress decided to establish their own oh, currency, boy. known as the Continental Dollar. Real creative there. Then the Revolutionary <laughs> War started, and it dawned on people that these wow. pieces of paper wouldn't be very useful in a giant pile of wet tea and smoldering patriots, causing their value to do one of those horny mm. eagle death spirals. Then the Congress did, you know, that stupid thing that every high schooler learns is stupid, not invading Russia in winter, but the other one, practically money. making them worth less than their weight in paper and ink. And wouldn't you know it, a good portion of the Continental Army was paid with uh, Oh, no. So by the time the war ended, many veterans were left totally destitute. The aristocrats were like, well, these grass-eating untermenches did kind of give us a country. Wow. So whatever, we'll throw them a few cents and take this trash off their hands. Dexter was like, ooh, ooh, I'm a wealthman. I I'm going to do a that wealth too. Man. And he spent the majority of his savings buying a boatload after boatload of the 1780s equivalent of blockbuster gift cards. By all accounts, uh. this should have been his ruin. But by some stroke of luck, after the Constitution was ratified, the new government decided that they trade Continentals for treasury those are so goofy looking continental bucks for <laughs> yes mm. this looks historically accurate i <laughs> i love it <laughs> is this why this was so heavily recommended i i have a feeling it might be with 1% of their face value. Doesn't sound like much, but keep in mind, Dexter bought thousands of crates of bills for fractions of pennies apiece. So as buybacks began across the country, his stockpile appreciated massively in value. Wow. And this informer of deer realized that, for the first time, there were a lot of bucks in Malden. But just because he was now a man of the upper crust doesn't mean he let it go to his head. Sure, he might have purchased the most luxurious chateau the money could buy through daily Playboy Mansion-style ragers and commissioned wow. over 40 statues of America's greatest heroes, one of which was of himself, with a plaque calling him, quote, the greatest philosopher in the Western world. Wow. 
Despite his incredible that attack and displays of wealth, his contemptuous contemporary still saw him for the loud, illiterate rube he was. So they started giving him deliberately awful investment tips in order to get him to bankrupt himself. One such if he existed now, I would whisper in his ear to tell him to invest in, in nuclear power. Not that it's an awful investment tip. It is a great investment tip, especially small modular reactors where we can have them in smaller communities um, in addition to powering large cities where you can build them all in a factory. And hey, you can even repower old coal and natural gas plants um, just replace the heat source with these small modular reactors. I mean, yeah, extensive testing has, has to be involved, but it's, it is considerably less expensive than, um, than building a full size nuclear power plant from scratch. And you'll realize economies of scale by continuing to uh, build more of these. We'll learn how to build them more, efficient, more efficiently too. And man, that would that would be so cool. Nuclear would become modular just like uh, renewables, except with all the additional advantages that nuclear brings, like baseload power, simply more more megawatts, and uh, less dangerous maintenance. Uh, you don't have to worry about people um, falling off wind turbines. Of advice was that he should ship warming pans to the Caribbean. Warming For those of you pans. born after 18, to build a nuclear reactor in the Caribbean, this dish <laughs> on a long pole that you fill up with hot coals to warm up your bed. Not much use in a tropical paradise. But Dexter was undeterred by such frivolous things as logic. Went ahead and sent over 40,000 of them to the West Indies. When they arrived, the locals didn't really know what they were looking at and decided to use them as ladles molasses. for the sugar and molasses refineries. And by the end of it, Dexter sold every single one at a market that was near 80 percent. Frustrated that their plan wow, backfired, 80%. the elites then told him to literally carry coal to Newcastle, which is an old idiom used to describe a pointless task based off the fact that Newcastle was one of the world's biggest producers. I've never of heard coal. of that one. The That's only cool idiom expression. Dexter knew about all involved different animals shitting in the woods. So he took their word on good faith and went along with it. But by some divine providence, by the time the shipment arrived, the Newcastle coal miners had all gone on strike, strike and Dexter once again cleared the entire shipment with a hefty profit. He was like, man, I am so smart. By this point, he was pretty confident Talk in his about speculation lucky. skills. This so he started is, this making awesome. seemingly far-fetched ventures all by himself. One time he had a bunch of stray cats rounded up Those for basically free. Terrifying. Which sounds like herding cats, but what do I know? And he sent them to the Caribbean, where they were gobbled up en masse. Not like eaten, but purchased to deal with all <laughs> the rat the infestations. Cats? In another instance, he bought up just about every whalebone in Boston. And coincidentally, at the same time in France, men started wearing corsets too for some reason. Mm. Demand went way up, Dexter's laughing. Now from an outside perspective, Again. at the end of the day, Dexter was a very shrewd merchant. So at this point in my research, I was like, wait a minute, is he smart? Then I learned about his life outside of business. <laughs> Dexter considered <laughs> himself fan. extremely knowledgeable on just about every topic. Key words, considered himself. For example, uh. he once thought stumbled upon a guy painting a sign to go along with the newly built statue of Jefferson. And when he saw that the sign called Jefferson the writer of the Declaration of Independence, Dexter lost his freaking mind and insisted that Jefferson did not pen the DOI, but rather the Constitution. Spoiler alert, not remotely true. Wow. He was in France at the time. An easy mistake to make today, sure. But this was only like 10 years after the fact. That's someone today saying, Obama didn't kill bin Laden, dumbass. That was Bill Clinton. <laughs> anyway, when the painter refused to change the inscription, Dexter started shooting at him with a long rifle until he complied. Real gentil. Dexter made sure to surround wow. himself with the requisite number of weirdos to maintain this level of delusion. One of which was Jonathan Plummer, a man whom Dexter paid to be his poet laureate, writing only the most laudatory odes in <laughs> Quality poet laureate right there. Honor. Mind you, this wasn't just your run-of-the-mill wise and wizened wordsmith. Jonathan sold fish for a living. And porn. He just kind of went along with the whole thing for the pocket change. Besides, the idea of this self proclaimed genius and self proclaimed knowledge person reminds me of something that happened after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So, being in nuclear power, we actually studied the spill a bit because we like to learn things from other um, industrial accidents, including ones that aren't just uh, nuclear related. Because, to be fair, nuclear accidents don't happen nearly as often as accidents do in other industries. So in studying this, we happened upon the Hutchinson Lazarian Frequency Generator. I'll put a link in the description on this, but this was developed by another set of self-proclaimed geniuses that 
manage to find some magic frequency to heal the earth and clean up the oil. This is back when it was gushing out of the well. And yeah, it's, it was, it's just so bizarre. It kind of reminds me of like the life stream from Final Fantasy VII, except, uh, <laughs> except for oil. I mean, I don't know where people come up with these sort of things, but I'm not a self-proclaimed genius, so uh, I wouldn't know, I guess. Entourage, Dexter occasionally spent time with the total geeds known as his family. He had two children whom the New England Historical Society describes as a half mad drunk and a completely mad drunk respectively. And he couldn't stand his wife on account of her perceived constant nagging, to the point where he would tell guests he was unmarried and that he just had a ghost in his house. Just like, oh yeah, that's a sea hag. You know, mansion built on some old Indian shipwreck or something. <laughs> Timmy, please. I'm cold and my hands are rheumatic. Find it in your heart to light the fireplace for me? Yeah, plenty of that in hell, you banshee bitch. One day, oh, wow. in a massive stroke of ego, Dexter decided He's to fake digger. his own death, complete with a lavish funeral service just to see who would show up. Lucky for him, about 3,000 people from all walks of life turned up. Though initially staying out of sight, he soon noticed that his wife wasn't crying. So in response, wow. he jumped out and started hitting her upside the head with a cane in front of everybody. But as his true mortality grew closer, Dexter knew he needed a legacy and decided to pen his memoirs, titled A Pickle for the Knowing Ones, which was basically what? just 20 20 pages of unhinged ranting about politics, religion, his wife, and whatever else came to mind. No punctuation. Random capitalization. The most amazing oh boy, spelling no, I've this ever would drive seen. Me crazy. George Washington. Uh. Attitude. Philosopher. <laughs> tobacco. General. And this is all just <laughs> from the first few lines. The entire book is written like this. And just like everything else the guy did, the thing sold like fucking hotcakes. Why does anybody even try? The best part is that when he got complaints about the total lack of grammatical anything, in the second edition of the book, he put an extra page at the end full of nothing but punctuation marks with a little note wow. saying that anyone who felt like Talk about your malicious compliance. Dexter died in 1806, and by and large, he probably should have ended up in Davy Jones' locker. What a way to go given out. the circumstances, I imagine the big man upstairs dropped his big deck of mortal soul trading cards at just the right moment, letting him slip <laughs> through the pearly gates undetected. What? And legend has it that to this day, if you pray to the name Timothy Dexter, he'll look upon you kindly and share his skills with you all. Till next time, I'm Sam Manella, and thank you for watching. This was probably one of my favorite one of Sam Manella's videos. It was just so, so crazy. I mean, can you imagine being that lucky and that unhinged as far as investments? And you know what? I take that back about this guy investing in nuclear power. That's probably not for the best considering, considering how crazy he was. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.